and the oath of CMN directors. With today's interview, Chef Vicky and I are very excited to introduce two very special professors from Stanford. Our first interviewee is Grant Miller, who is a professor of medicine at the Stanford Un University School of Medicine, along with Jesse Bruner, who is the deputy director of strategy and program development director in human trafficking research. They both decided to gather data on human trafficking and the Stanford University Human Trafficking Data Lab. We're really excited for this interview, and we hope that you guys learn more about this interview in the perspective of research and professors. See you soon. So Grant, what inspired you to research about human trafficking, given that you work in the field of economic health policy? That's a great question. Uh, I don't know how much time you have for an answer. Um, you know, I, I sort of came to global health from a, an even earlier background of being interested in social work, which was actually what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, and uh, my work uh, related to global health really brought me face to face with uh, the broad set of challenges that impact people's health. And it's really difficult to ignore um, really acute instances of flagrant human rights abuses, frankly. Um, and as someone that sort of, as part of finding my own career path, uh, has tried hard to combine things that are important to me and places that I can contribute as well as just knowing myself better and realizing that there's a part of me that enjoys the, the geekier analytical side of um, finding ways to contribute as well. Um, it was really striking that there is just very little um, quantitative, uh, more analytic work that has been done related to human trafficking. There, there are amazing lifelong committed uh, people that have worked in advocacy and have done research on human trafficking, but there have not been uh, at least as far as I could tell, a real revolution in the use of um, data the way there's been in other fields. And we can talk more about it. I think the real reason is not that people haven't tried, but I think previously there has not been an enormous amount of reasonably good quantitative data that just exists to, to work on human trafficking. So that was kind of how I came to it, along with uh, meeting people whom I admire um, a great deal like Jesse. Uh, who I think have really helped to show a path for how to do that. I totally agree. I think it's really amazing how you're able to give up something so big to go into something so small. And Jesse, so why did you decide to become a strategy and program development director for human trafficking research? Thanks for that question, Shivani, and it's great to, to be speaking with you both today. Um, so I actually hold sort of two hats with the Center for Human Rights and International Justice at Stanford. One is Deputy Director of Strategy and Program Development, and the other is Director of Human Trafficking Research. Um, and so it's kind of great for me because I like to um, sort of be a jack of all, a jill of all trades um, um, and make connections across sort of disparate, disparate projects. And so this gives me a chance to kind of think about where I think the field of human trafficking research should be going and um, get to work deeply in that with, with awesome teams, such as the one I'm on with Grant, as well as some others. But it also means that I'm sort of um, administratively helping to run an academic human rights center. And that means a lot of working with students, other faculty, developing new courses um, and other curricula, um, setting up internship opportunities for students, things like that, and making sure basically that the Stanford community writ large has access to um, information, events, um, experts, et cetera, relevant to human rights. And so um, I really enjoy getting to bounce between the two. But I think your question opens a good opportunity to sort of emphasize that um, personally, I don't believe that like career arcs are always very well planned. So I don't know that I actually like decided to um, step into this role. I think that you know, I've had like kind of a, I've had an interesting background. I was a journalist right out of college, which is what I sort of studied to be. Um, and then I developed training in sort of broad social science curricula, um, including through my master's work. And so um, really I see my career arc so far as just picking up skills along the way that I can then apply to things that I care about. And I think like that's really, it's 
really a huge privilege to be able to set up your career around the nexus of what you are good at, either because you believe it or because you've been told that you're good at it, and also what you care about. And that is something that's not available to a lot of people. And so I really just try to appreciate that um, day to day because it is it really is a tremendous um, privilege to get to work at that intersection. Um, in terms of why human trafficking specifically, I think Grant, you know, drew on this very well. For me, um, I think this issue really in a lot of ways highlights some of the worst of humanity, unfortunately. Um, the international definition of human trafficking that comes from the Polaro Protocol uses language around abuse of a position of vulnerability. And even though I personally have um, I have sort of a complicated relationship with that word vulnerability because I think sometimes it deprives communities of agency. Um, at the same time, that phrasing really struck me um, when I started working on this issue because you're, you know, here's an opportunity where someone clearly could use support and use, um, you know, use more access to services or, um, you know, could be put into a better position in their society and, and instead, um, they're being exploited. And so I think that's why specifically I wanted to get engaged on the issue of human trafficking. Thank you for sharing. You mentioned a lot of good points about, you know, connecting what you're good at and what you're interested in. So I think it's really amazing how much you've done in terms of human trafficking um, prevention development. And with that, our next question is, how's the lack of data and quantitative evidence on human trafficking a detriment to finding prevention methods? Um, I'll offer something on that. Um, yeah, maybe it sounds overly simplistic, but if you don't know um, about root causes in a large scale systematic way and you don't know what's working and what's not working, it's very hard to be part of a conversation which is focused on trying to improve programs and policies to address something as troubling as human trafficking. And a, a lack of data really leads to that, to be honest. And maybe we'll talk some about some of the specific projects that we're working on related to this. But uh, there's really been, I think, a revolution in, um, in social policy. I think there's been a revolution in social entrepreneurship. Many fields uh, now rely much more on um, metrics, evaluation, understanding what works. I think the next step beyond that is really understanding not just what works, but why it works. Something that works in one place may not work in another. Um, in fact, that is almost always the case, but that doesn't mean one can't learn lessons from what's worked in one place that may be applicable to a, a different place that one would like to apply them. Um, but without good data and the learning that can come from it, it's really hard to make progress in a very um, linear way or even in a forward moving way. So, um, so I think lack of data is a huge hindrance. Um, companies use data to improve their performance. Governments use data to understand how well they're serving um, the populations to which they're responsible. Um, if you don't have data, you just can't really do a good job and you can't do better over time. Yes, I totally agree. I think that at least being aware of the data can definitely help you with your researching and just thinking about why it's important and how it can develop over time because this can be negative data and positive data and it's nice to see like it overall. With that being said, why do you think that the collaboration is critical in anti-trafficking prevention, whether it's the academia, healthcare, or AI? Sorry, I can take that one. Um, so I think um, collaboration is critical uh, for me, at least on any issue that I work on. Um, I, I'd never work on projects alone. Um, but for better or worse, the issue of human trafficking in particular, it resonates with a lot of different groups, um, a lot of different kinds of people coming at it with very different perspectives. Um, and so it's actually imperative that we figure out ways um, to work together. Um, I think, you know, we need to remember that folks come at things from their own experience and perspective, and they're always going to see it based on that lens. Um, and so, 
you know, that can actually combine very powerfully um, as I think our lab has done and I'll get into that in a minute. But I would say anti-trafficking in particular, efforts at anti-trafficking sort of come at from two broad approaches. That's not to say there's only two, but there's, you know, sort of a more law enforcement focused approach. And that comes with sort of a set of um, assumptions and approaches. And then there's more of a public health approach. Um, and these, you know, get applied, I think, across the board, but I think get associated in some ways. The law enforcement piece often gets associated more with the prosecution um, part of anti-trafficking effort and the public health approach um, gets applied more in the prevention and protection spaces. Um, and so just right there, you can see why you would need to collaborate to sort of get at um, these various, uh, various uh, perspectives on the issue. Um, I think a, a critical piece of collaboration is really ensuring that survivors um, are, you know, front and center in, in at the very least, informing this work and, of course, leading um, whenever possible. I think, um, unfortunately, that impetus has really only emerged strongly in the anti-trafficking space within the last, like, five, ten years. Um, for a long time, you know, coming from sort of the abolitionist movement from when we look towards slavery, you know, the narratives that we learned, um, I think growing up and in history were often centered around, you know, white abolitionists that were leading these movements. And I think that, you know, it sort of discounted um, um, areas where, where slaves or formerly enslaved people or enslaved people um, were, you know, driving that um, that movement as well. And I think that that is unfortunately something that carried forward for a long time into the anti-trafficking space. But really in the last like five to 10 years, I think we've seen that shifting and um, we're seeing, you know, fortunately great progress where um, a lot more actors and, you know, governments, NGOs, various stakeholder groups um, are um, coming around and recognizing the importance of, of survivors being central to this work. Um, for example, um, uh, the Global Fund to End Modern Slavery, which is a, a large funder and, and key actor in the anti-trafficking space, just appointed um, an amazing leader who also happens to be a survivor to, as their new CEO, um, which is a big step, I think, in the anti-trafficking field, um, Sophie Otiende. Uh, so, so it's nice to see that emergence. Um, and in the case of our lab, I think the broader point about collaboration really comes out in that even though we're still a pretty small group, our core group is, you know, maybe seven, seven or so people. And then we have a lot of collaborators and students that we work with and such. But even across the core group, we bring a lot of different disciplinary expertise, as well as I think, sort of lived experience in terms of the work that we've done both in and out of the academy. Um, and I, I think it's great to remember that, you know, if you're coming from computer science, you have just a completely different educational background and set of technical skills and a toolkit that is maybe very different than an economist or um, a lawyer or a human rights expert. And um, seeing how that all works together in the case of our lab has been really powerful. And so I think collaboration is generally, though it can get complicated, obviously, the more people you have, the more voices uh, you have to sort of manage and find a way to get them to sing in harmony. But um, it can really help when it comes to uh, creating more robust approaches to the work. Definitely. And it's great to see the progress in human trafficking, you know, advocacy and prevention over these last few years. And you touched up on this earlier, but what is the Stanford Human Trafficking Data Lab and what are some of the main focuses? I'll make a go at that. Um, so we are a, a multidisciplinary collection of people uh, across the Stanford campus, uh, also with partners uh, outside of campus um, at other universities and other organizations. Um, but I'd say importantly, and I, I want to highlight, we are partnering with um, numerous people very intensively right now in uh, Brazil. Um, and in many ways, our work and our partnerships in Brazil is kind of a test case for something that we hope will be productive and will be something that provides a strategy and a path for collaborations uh, that hopefully 
will blossom over time. We'd love to be part of them. We'd love to see them blossom even if we're not part of them. Um, but in particular, directly with people who are involved in policy decision making and the design of programs. So the, the real aha moment for us came um, when we met um, uh, one person in particular, Luis Assis, who is a federal labor prosecutor. He's also founded something called the Smart Lab, which is really a data resource which draws on very rich administrative data sources that uh, Brazil maintains. And it has been an attempt to try to use these, um, these data resources for the purposes of improving public policy. And so Smart Lab, you can go online, you can look up what Smart Lab has been doing. Um, Luis has been busy trying to build tools for many of his colleagues in different agencies with some type of responsibility related to human trafficking or other types of labor issues that his office is responsible for. For us, it was a real aha moment, moment meeting Luis because you know, in universities, we use data to do all kinds of things, and we saw the potential to take what Luis was doing and work with him and other partners in Brazil and take it even farther than what Smart Lab had been doing um, and apply tools that we know in our own work. And so going back to something I mentioned before, first of all, all of a sudden, here is an opportunity to access and collaborate with people who use very large amounts of data that can be used quantitatively and much more systematically at a population level or a national level to learn about human trafficking. How do human trafficking markets work? What makes people vulnerable to human trafficking in the first place? How well are current policies that are in place to try to deter human trafficking actually working? And um, that's really a remarkable thing. Um, and that data exists not just in Brazil, it exists in many places, but people don't typically sit around thinking about how their data can be used for things that are maybe not part of their job responsibility. So a person sitting in one agency may have a lot of information. They're concerned about what that agency does very rightfully, and they can be very committed to that work, but they may not be thinking, how can I combine this data with data from colleagues in other agencies to collectively try to learn more about human trafficking. And so we saw the opportunity to try to use Brazil as a demonstration of what's possible. So we set out in collaboration with uh, the Smart Lab and with Luis and with others in Brazil to try to show the impact that could be achieved by the use, the rigorous use of these existing administrative data sets that, that may not be possible in every country where it would be important to do that. But there certainly are some countries that have very strong administrative data foundations. And so we're very excited about the, the, the potential to work hand in hand with policymakers to really um, show what can be done. I think that's really admirable. But a question that I have is how come you guys decided to go and do human trafficking in Brazil? I can jump in quickly on that. Um, um, so honestly, a, a little bit of it is is opportunistic. Um, Grant mentioned our partnership with Luis Assis, which has been um, just absolutely critical to being able to do the work in the way that we envision. And, and actually, though, I mean, Brazil is, I mean, it's obviously a huge economy, um, not only in Latin America, but in the world. And given its large size geographically as well, um, um, that means in the case of a lot of the types of trafficking that we're looking at, which is um, mostly forced labor issues, um, you know, the Brazilian Amazon is, um, is this huge, huge space that is, um, you know, in many ways difficult to access. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of labor camps um, being set up in sort of deep regions of the Amazon where, where it's just a lot easier to um, exploit folks because you're quite isolated. Um, you know, it's areas that are not being regularly inspected or monitored by um, either, either law enforcement or civil society actors. Um, but yeah, because of the size of the economy, you're sort of naturally going to have, um, you're going to have 
uh, trafficking issues and and labor exploitation issues broadly creeping up. So um, it made sense both from a opportunistic standpoint of having the right people in the room, but also um, it is definitely a hub um, in the region for for trafficking. Um, so that was why we started there. But we are and looking through. Shivani, I really just want to underscore it's an excellent question. Our hope, like what success would look like for us would be inspiring people to try to do work like this in many other parts of the world. And successfully demonstrating that it can be done is really our more immediate goal, but uh, it's our desperate hope that other people will get involved as a result. Yeah, so thank you for sharing about, you know, why you chose Brazil. And I really do hope that, you know, same efforts are made across other countries. And with that, our last question is, what are a few goals that you hope to achieve with the data lab and where do you see it headed? Well, I can offer some of my thoughts on this. Um, Jesse and I talk about this a lot. Um, so right now, some of our projects are focused on very, uh, very action oriented ends. So we're working, for example, to develop tools that people with direct responsibility for detection, inspection, and prosecution, uh, as well as prevention of human trafficking in Brazil could use to improve their work. And there seems to be a real openness to trying out these tools uh, and actually looking long and hard to see how well they work. Um, and if they do in fact work, and we feel very optimistic about them, having immediate impact with partners who are really focused in their daily lives on anti-trafficking policy and programs uh, is our immediate goal. I think, <clears throat> as both Jesse and I mentioned before, longer term goal would be to see the greater use of data in an impactful and action oriented way in many countries, not just Brazil, and routine uh, policy and, and programmatic work. That would be, um, that would really be a, a wonderful, wonderful long term outcome for all of us. Yeah, I'll just add, um, I, I'm 100% in agreement with what Grant highlighted. Um, I would add, you know, I think more broadly demonstrating to sort of the anti-trafficking movement, which is, you know, a nebulous term, but um, I'll go ahead and use it. You know, what is, what really is possible with data, like what we can understand beyond sort of, um, I think a lot of, a lot of research in the anti-trafficking field, unfortunately, has been, you know, a bit sort of, I don't want to say service level, but like we are, we're still not sort of getting at um, how to address the deeper drivers and what sustains um, this issue. And I, you know, my hope is that we will be able to show sort of what's possible when, to Grant's earlier point, you look at data from a new perspective and think like, what can this tell me about trafficking, the vulnerabilities that lead to trafficking or the, re the social realities, the economic realities, et cetera, um, that enable, create an enabling environment where this problem continues to exist and really demonstrate um, that we can be more creative with the data that does exist. It's not just a matter of there not being data, which was the narrative for a very long time, I think in this space, um, but it's more about what can we learn from what is out there if we just, are more creative in how we approach it. And then I think also um, another point I'd highlight is just um, the research collaboration piece. I think, you know, um, the fact that we're working so closely with, with Luis um, in his role with the Federal Labor Prosecution Office and sort of that network of, of, of his colleagues in Brazil, um, research doesn't always happen that way, right? You know, sometimes research is quite far removed from the communities that it aims to understand or aims to maybe even serve in, in whatever it's trying to create through the research, if that research is meant to support the development of a tool or an intervention of some sort. And um, I would love to see you know, us continue to develop our relationships and, and the strength of that partnership, and then also see that grow as sort of a model for more inclusive participatory um, research methods that could be applied more broadly in new contexts. 
I'd like to add one last thing to Jesse's point, if I may. Um, I, I really appreciate what you said, Jesse, and I wanted to highlight and, and emphasize something that you brought out, which is in addition to making tools that we hope can make a difference right now, <clears throat> and we can figure it out in a, in a rigorous way, we're really committed to trying to understand the structural deeper issues that are underlying an entire environment that leads to human trafficking. And so an example of this might be people say, you know, poverty is a risk factor for human trafficking. Well, that's not very surprising. Um, it's probably true in some statistical sense, the way an epidemiologist would define a risk factor, but it's it's not that helpful. Certainly, you know, anti-poverty policy is very important um, and finding ways to improve that is incredibly valuable, but um, I don't think that's very helpful for understanding the structural reasons why lower income people may be more vulnerable to, um, to trafficking. And so we really want to be able to take advantage of the partnerships and the resources that we uh, have developed through them to try to understand some of these deeper structural issues so that, so that people that care about it can be effective in a much more upstream uh, way that uh, really gets at the root causes, not just going out and putting out fires successfully here, there, where they pop up. If I may, I totally agree. I think that a lot of people think why human trafficking isn't as important is because people assume that because it happens more commonly in third world countries, it doesn't really affect them for their first world and we like a high income, but it's actually pretty common in the first world country too. And with that being said, thank you guys so much for this interview. We really appreciate your thoughts and opinions and wonderful points. Wish you guys the best of luck for the Brazil trip with Louise and really hope that you guys are successful. I'm going to stop the recording now, unless there's anything else you guys want to say. Oh, we're really grateful to you for having us. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you both.